two undercover narcotics officers pull up to what looks like a drug deal going down. They've been scoping out the situation for months and they're ready to make their move. But their investigation hasn't taken them to back alleys and seedy parts of the city, but instead to lavish homes and nightclubs. They're fighting a new kind of war and to infiltrate this world means looking the part Decked out in the finest clothes and cruising around in a black Ferrari, the two of them represent a whole new era of crime fighter. I'm Jamie Logie, and this is Everything 80s, a podcast that looks back on a decade that forever changed the way we dress, consumed, and connected. And today, we travel back to an era of neon and loafers in the TV show that not only made a huge splash for NBC, but also had a massive influence on pop culture. It's the show that changed the way TV looked and sounded. This is the history of Miami Vice. Is there a better representation of everything that made the 80s the 80s than Miami Vice? It's the quintessential 1980s show that captured everything that defined the era. The look, the clothing, and the music, this show had it all. Miami Vice ran from 1984 to 1989 on NBC and is about two undercover Miami police detectives named James Sonny Crockett and Ricardo Rico Tubbs. The two live in high-flying Miami and combat the drug world, which despite being seedy, still appears to be glamorous. Because of all the wealth and excess associated with the drug world in Miami, Tubbs and Crockett need to look the part to infiltrate their way in. And that means dressing a certain way, driving around in high-end cars, and surrounding themselves with beautiful people. So how does this show, which sounds like it could be a movie, come to be? We begin with the then-president of NBC, Brandon Tartikoff. We also need to begin with the new music television channel that had taken the culture by storm, MTV. And gentlemen, rock and roll. I have a previous episode all about the history of MTV, but this channel changed the way we consume music. After it first launched in 1981, the channel was an immediate success. Artists became more visual than ever, and their presentation and look in these new music videos had a massive influence on the culture. The looks worn by Madonna and Cyndi Lauper were soon copied by an entire generation. Influential bands like Duran Duran, Culture Club, and even A Flock of Seagulls also had an influence on the look and fashion at the time. Music is an extension of lifestyle, and MTV helped beam the latest and coolest music, artists, and fashion into our living rooms. Brandon Tartikoff noticed the massive impact MTV was having on an entire generation. The influence of this new music channel was undeniable, and it gave him an idea. NBC needed to capitalize on the success of MTV by creating its own music-oriented program. According to Looper, while brainstorming ideas for a new show, Tartikoff wrote down two simple words, MTV Cops. Many great ideas often start with a simple concept, and this one was a compelling idea. Now Anthony Yurkovich enters the picture. Yurkovich, a producer and writer, worked on shows like Starsky and Hutch, Heart to Heart, and Hill Street Blues. The memo about a show featuring cops with an MTV influence was passed on to him. For Yurkovich, this was interesting. According to a 1985 Time Magazine article, while working on Hill Street Blues, Yurkovich had already been thinking up something somewhat similar but he envisioned a movie about a pair of vice cops in Miami 
as he had a real fascination with South Florida. But with this new idea presented, he ran to his typewriter to hammer out a script for a two-hour pilot that seemed like it could be a TV movie. He even gave it a name, Gold Coast. This, of course, eventually changed to Miami Vice. Yurkovich brought to life his vision of this fascinating world of drugs and crime. The premise and location were there, but now who would play the two cops? Dozens of people were auditioned, and it was taking so long to find the perfect leads that NBC delayed filming the pilot. But finally, they decided on Philip Michael Thomas for the role of Ricardo Tubbs. Thomas had been in several movies and appeared on many TV shows, including Starsky and Hutch, Good Times, and The New Adventures of Wonder Woman. For the role of Sonny Crockett, things took a little longer. Don Johnson had also been in quite a few movies, TV shows, and pilots. He also did a little songwriting. The producers liked Johnson, but NBC wasn't sure about him. But eventually, the pair was in place. But then, there was another main character in the show that was critical in creating a specific tone and look for Miami Vice, and that was the city of Miami itself. Since MTV was all about creating an image and making mini movies, Miami Vice would be no different. This would be a show about aesthetics and creating a specific atmosphere. This meant showcasing a lot of bright neon colors and a glossy look. Miami Vice would feature a lot of colors not normally seen on TV shows, as there are certain colors that can be difficult to shoot. Miami Vice was going to push the limits on the aesthetics. If that meant repainting a house to stand out more, they did it. The city of Miami also needed to look flashy and glossy. Besides the bold neon colors, Another way to accomplish this glossy look was by constantly spraying down the roads with water. For scenes shot at night, the water gave Miami a distinctive look and created beautiful reflections of the lights and even the moon. But a production like this would not come cheap. According to Time Magazine, the average episode shot on location in Miami was around $1.3 million. That's about 300,000 more than all the other cop shows on TV at the time. But the visuals were just one side of the coin. There was another character to pay strict attention to. And it's the character at the core of this entire project. The music. The directors were to not only use a lot of music, but also find the most creative ways to use that music. Music was going to drive Miami Vice. And all of this brings us to the pilot episode. In the first two-part pilot episode entitled Brothers Keeper, we meet Sonny Crockett who has just lost his former partner in a car bombing. While investigating a cocaine dealer, Crockett meets a New York narcotics detective who turns out to be Ricardo Tubbs. It also turns out that the cocaine dealer killed Tubbs' brother, and now Tubbs is seeking revenge. The two of them decide to team up and capture the dealer. But after the dealer pays $2 million in bail, he ends up escaping. Crockett then persuades Tubbs to stick with him and enter the world of Southern law enforcement. That first pilot needed to establish a lot of things. The premise, the world of Miami, the specific look, and just as notably, the music. The pilot episode of Miami Vice features one of the coolest scenes I can ever remember from a TV show in the 80s. The shot of Crockett and Tubbs driving in a black Ferrari, 
while Phil Collins in the air tonight plays over the scene. The shot, which wasn't just a short clip, uses almost all of the five-minute song. Director of the pilot, Thomas Carter, says that in this scene, he wanted to capture how Crockett was beginning to lose touch with reality. His marriage was falling apart, and the scene needed a, quote, mournful resonance. In the Air Tonight was the perfect song to capture the tone they wanted with this show, in a way to showcase the unique visuals of Miami Vice. In this one scene, Miami Vice perfectly launched itself and established the entire essence of the show. The look, the cinematography, the music, and the overall style were all there. Carter calls it, quote, probably the prototypical Miami Vice sequence, unquote. This really was a groundbreaking scene in the history of television. Not only do we hear the majority of a current and popular song played over a few different scenes, but most of all the background sounds are removed as the song drives the emotion and drama of the scene. It feels almost dreamlike. Using a popular song over a specific dramatic and climactic portion of a show is quite common today, but it really wasn't back in the mid-80s. Miami Vice was quickly changing the way television was made. In just that one scene, and in the debut pilot itself, Miami Vice already looked like nothing else on TV. So how was this show going to do? Was it too unique to fit into a primetime lineup that featured top shows that couldn't be any more different, like The Cosby Show, Family Ties, and Cheers? It turns out NBC didn't have anything to worry about, as Miami Vice was about to take the world by storm and become bigger than anyone ever imagined. It would also become a massive influence on the culture in a way few TV shows ever have. Everything 80s will return after these messages. The two-part pilot of Miami Vice debuted on Sunday, September 16, 1984, on NBC. In its fall preview, the New York Times called it, quote, an experimental detective program with a rock and roll music score and new video techniques, unquote. The show then began its regular broadcast schedule, starting on September 28th. This new cutting-edge and flashy show was like TV cinema. And this was by design, as shows like Miami Vice were used to try to lure writers and directors who normally steered clear of television. Another lesser-known show that came out at the same time that used a similar approach was a science fiction series called Amazing Stories. And this has a connection to a previous episode of mine, as one of the stories to be featured was about a species of mechanical alien robots visiting Earth. But director Steven Spielberg thought that this story would work better as a theatrical release. And that story became the movie Batteries Not Included. I have a previous episode all about Steven Spielberg's work in the 1980s if you want to check that out. Miami Vice came out in the fall of 1984, making it a part of the 84-85 TV season. Then on Miami Vice, a loan shark operation sets up Sunny for the kill. You're under arrest. Will he take the fall to protect an old flame? Friday. Even though it wasn't a gigantic hit right out of the gate, Miami Vice managed to crack the top 40 most watched shows of the season, averaging a rating of about 14.4. That rating would basically make it the most watched TV show today by far, but back in 84, 85, this was a far cry from juggernauts like Dallas, Dynasty, and The Cosby Show. But it didn't take long for Miami Vice to climb those charts. A non-Dallas and Dynasty younger demographic quickly gravitated to the style of the show and the music that they were now more familiar with thanks to MTV. Miami Vice quickly picked up speed and 
going into the fall of 1985, quickly hit its stride. If you grew up during this point in the 80s and are of a certain age, I don't have to tell you the massive impact of Miami Vice. This was one of the most compelling things on TV, and there had never been anything quite like it. Miami Vice, at its core, had that simple but invaluable component to it. It was cool. Extremely cool. Miami Vice was quickly becoming must-see TV before that phrase was even a thing. And I was enamored with it. But for my mom, this show was completely off-limits which, of course, made me want to watch it even more. So I would try to sneak and watch it whenever I could. Sorry to my mom if she's listening. Shows like The A-Team and Knight Rider were more on the dramatic cinematic side, but still had a cartoony element to them. Miami Vice was more adult. It was stylish, sexy, and even a little dangerous. And all of these elements brought in viewers, a lot of viewers. The second season also began with a two-hour premiere. And continuing in the second season, the show still aired on Friday nights. Friday nights traditionally haven't been a big night for primetime network shows, but Miami Vice was destination viewing. And on Friday, could have some less competition. For the 1985-1986 season, Miami Vice rocketed up to the top 10 most watched shows. According to the Nielsen ratings, it hit number 9 with a huge 21.3 rating. That rating meant that on a Friday night, at least one out of every five TVs turned on were tuned in to Miami Vice. On an all-new Miami Vice, a brutal gang ravages the city. Can Sonny play dirty enough to stop him? Primitive but effective. Friday. It still wasn't Cosby Show or Family Ties numbers, but Miami Vice was beating out shows like Night Court, Growing Pains, and even Monday Night Football. Miami Vice became so big that in the fall of 1985, a painted image of Johnson and Thomas landed the cover of Time Magazine with the headline, Cool Cops, Hot Show. If you were around in the 80s, you know what a coveted spot the cover of Time Magazine was. It was a definite sign that you had made it. This was like a comedian getting the AOK sign from Johnny Carson and invited over to the couch, but just in magazine form. With the show now a hit and having established itself as the MTV cop show, even more focus was put on the show's music. And now the budget reflected this. The show would spend at least $10,000 an episode to license original music. That's more like $30,000 in today's money. Miami Vice made use of the popular songs of the time and also used popular artists like U2 and Frankie Goes to Hollywood. The show captured that unique new wave sound that was a real representation of this point in the 80s. But it wasn't just about incorporating the hot new sounds of the time. Miami Vice used the best music possible for a specific scene. Sometimes this would be music from the 1950s. It could be Gladys Knight and the Pips or Patti LaBelle. But make no mistake, for artists to be featured on Miami Vice was a big deal and the show could help propel a single or album. Over the seasons, many top artists had their songs featured on the show. Cyndi Lauper, Huey Lewis and the News, Duran Duran, Billy Ocean, Depeche Mode, Peter Gabriel, The Rolling Stones, ZZ Top, The Police, Eric Clapton, and Lionel Richie are just some of those artists featured on the show. Not only was Miami Vice using popular music, but it was also broadcast in stereophonic sound, one of the first shows to do so. But along with the licensed original music was the accompanying soundtrack created by Jan Hammer. The music got so big that the show released several albums featuring music from the show. In 1985, Miami Vice, music from the television series featured songs from the first two seasons 
including In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins and You Belong to the City by Glenn Frey. That first compilation album also included the original instrumental music from the show, including the theme song. You Belong to the City reached number two on the Billboard Hot 100, and the Miami Vice theme song actually hit number one. Fun fact, according to The Independent, the Miami Vice theme was the last instrumental to top the U.S. charts until 2013 and the viral hit of that year, The Harlem Shake. And then the album itself hit number one on Billboard. Over the course of 1985 and then 1986, it managed to stay there for an incredible 11 weeks. According to MiamiViceFandom.com, this was a record for a TV soundtrack, and it continues to stand to this day. Miami Vice was a pop culture phenomenon, and in 1985, according to Billboard, the only album that spent more time at number one was Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits. In 1985, the Miami Vice soundtrack spent more time at number one than Like a Virgin by Madonna, We Are the World by USA for Africa, and Make It Big by Wham. Miami Vice even beat out the artists that helped to establish the musical tone of the show, No Jacket Required by Phil Collins. It's hard to emphasize how big the Miami Vice soundtrack was. It went four times platinum in the U.S., three times platinum in Canada, and even gold in England and Austria. If you grew up in the UK at that time, you may remember seeing Jan Hammer performing the Miami Vice theme song on top of the pops. And in another full circle moment, there was even an official music video on MTV of the Miami Vice theme song, an appearance on the channel that inspired the entire show. 1986 also brought the release of the next soundtrack, Miami Vice 2. This album was another compilation featuring artists like Roxy Music and Phil Collins again, along with more instrumentals. Through the music, tone, and aesthetic of the show, Miami Vice captured something very unique at the time. And speaking of that, I've already mentioned how the city of Miami and the music were just as much characters on the show. But then there was one other very critical character, one that may have had the biggest influence of all, the fashion. The distinctive clothing of Miami Vice, represented by a t-shirt under an Armani jacket, pastel colors and sockless loafers began to appear everywhere. It's easy to look back now and snicker at this look, but this was a driving force in fashion at the time. And again, it was all by design. Referring back to that 1985 Time Magazine article, a typical episode featured Crockett and Tubbs in at least five to eight different outfits. And, quote, the concept of the show is to be on top of all the latest fashion trends in Europe, unquote. Costume designer Bambi Breakstone would head to Paris, London, and Milan before the start of a season to choose the outfits for the coming year. Since they were going for that specific aesthetic, the show had approved colors that were allowed to be used. Those approved colors always had to be shades of blue, pink, green, fuchsia, and peach. Clothing from designers like Hugo Boss and Versace were often featured, which only continued to drive the influence of the Miami Vice fashion. In its second season, Miami Vice had peaked in the ratings, and then the third season debuted on September 26, 1986, running to May of 1987. The show had become so popular that it began to feature many guest stars and new actors such as Lawrence Fishburne, Julia Roberts, Bruce Willis, Bill Paxton, Helena Bonham Carter, 
Liam Neeson and Wesley Snipes. Some of the guest stars in those first few years featured a lot of famous people from the world of music, including the likes of Frank Zappa, Gene Simmons, Sheena Easton, Willie Nelson, and even James Brown. But the highs of season two couldn't be replicated. In season three, Miami Vice dropped down to number 26 in the Nielsen ratings, tied with Knott's Landing with a 16.8 rating. Still pretty good, but this was less than half the rating that the Cosby Show and Family Ties were now getting. But a lot of this may be because Miami Vice was now up against the landmark show, Dallas. In the fourth season, some of the weaker episodes of the entire series began to emerge. And this is around the time they brought in some of those bigger musical stars like James Brown and Sheena Easton to drive more interest. But at that point, Miami Vice dropped out of the top 30 highest rated shows. The fifth and final season debuted later in 1988, beginning on November 4th. It ran for 19 episodes, finishing up in May 1989 with a two-hour season finale where Crockett and Tubbs end up quitting the police force. Crockett sells his boat, releases his pet alligator, and moves further south to get away from Miami. Tubbs decides to head back to New York, and Crockett offers Tubbs a ride to the airport in a Ferrari, as the two drive off together. Even though the series finale aired in May 1989, three additional episodes were released in June of 1989, with a fourth released in January 1990. But clearly, by this point, Miami Vice was no longer the network powerhouse and massively influential show it once was. But that's understandable. TV shows can be just like fads. They come out hot, and eventually, all fads come to an end. But regardless of its longevity, Miami Vice had made its mark, and then some. At its core, Miami Vice is just a cop show, but one with a unique and stylish presentation. But the approach to the cop show dynamic had a big influence on future shows, Shows like CSI and many other modern police-based shows have taken some influence from Miami Vice. Even modern video games like Grand Theft Auto Vice City seem to be influenced by this show. Miami Vice showed us how TV could be cinematic. And did the tone and style of Miami Vice influence future shows looking to capture that same cinematic essence? Do we have shows like Twin Peaks, The Sopranos, ER, Lost, Breaking Bad, and up to today with Succession because of the framework Miami Vice established back in the mid-80s? In a 2001 interview with PBS, Sopranos creator David Chase said, quote, I don't think people cared about the visuals back in the 70s. The first show that I can recall, our drama, that did care about the visuals was Miami Vice. I think that made kind of a sea change, unquote. When I think of one of the most brilliant and defining scenes of The Sopranos, Phil admitting he wants revenge on Tony, while we see Tony at the christening, all set to John Cooper Clark's Evidently Chicken Town, it always felt like it had roots in the Miami Vice in the air tonight scene. Miami Vice showed us how a great scene could be built around a great song. Again, common today, but quite novel and groundbreaking back in the 80s. If you are of a certain age, Miami Vice was hands down the coolest thing on TV. It influenced an entire era with its music, presentation, and fashion. Miami Vice is the perfect snapshot of this time in the 80s. The impact that Miami Vice had on popular culture at the time really can't be overstated. It was a phenomenon in every sense of the word, and the type of viral hit that networks can only dream of. TV used to always play second fiddle to movies, but in the 80s, Miami Vice showed us all what the medium was truly capable of, even if you didn't need to wear any socks to do so.
And on that bombshell, it's time to end. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like what you heard, there's plenty more where that came from in my earlier episodes. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Everything 80s podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss out on new episodes. If you're interested in bonus audio content, you can check out patreon.com. That's a platform to not only support the show, but get access to things like the Everything 80s Movie Review Podcast. If you want to learn more, you can just head on over to patreon.com slash 80s. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash 80s. So that's it for me. Thank you again so much for listening. I'm Jamie. This has been Everything 80s, but I'll be back soon with the new episode. Don't you dare miss it. Bye.